Hey, welcome back to the studio. This is my day of play, where you're taken into the real events and actions of how it really went down before the process of editing or cleaning up. I mean, this is really how it went. Although I've been crushed by the effects of COVID, the journey's been to keep marching forward. We begin things with Dr. David Tolan, host of the hit A&E show, Hoarders. Are you one? Do you know someone who is? And this season, they're going back to check up on those that have been on the show before. Then we're stepping into the realms of political reality with author and historian Greg Unger. He paints a portrait of an America that most don't know. And we'll wrap things up with a modern-day Indiana Jones, Mr. Josh Gates from Expedition Unknown. This is my day of play, completely unedited in the way of meeting the wizard behind the curtain. I'm here, you know, Adobe Audition, you know, what a pain. <laughs> <laughs> All right, take it away, Arrow. <laughs> Doctor, it is a pleasure to share a conversation with you because, man, I have been waiting for this. Where are they now? And you're going to yeah. give us that. Yeah, I'm so excited about the Where Are They Nows. Um, you know, I, I, I think that if you watch the show, hopefully you get the impression that the show is very honest, mm -hmm. um, that we're not looking to gloss over or sugarcoat anything. I mean, when, when, when what I do helps, I want people to see that. And when what I do doesn't help, uh, it's unfortunate, but I want people to see that too. And there's always been this question of, okay, but when you helped somebody, did they stay helped or yeah. were you just slapping a temporary Band-Aid on this problem? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's an open question and I want people to see the answer. So we're going back to the homes of people that we have seen in previous seasons and we're checking up to see how they're doing. What does their home look like? What does their behavior look like? Did they stay better or did they go back to their old ways of doing things? Yeah, see, personally, I, I need to have this. And the reason why is because my wife and I went through the Swedish death cleaning where we got rid of so many things. But see, but it keeps coming back. And, and I want to know how these people, when it, when it kept coming back, what they do? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I mean, and, and we know from our scientific research that when people receive good therapy for hoarding disorder and they get better more often than not they stay better but it's unclear whether that's the case uh, uh, you know on the show hoarders mm -hmm. i mean are these same people gonna gonna continue to do well when we come back and see them i love the way that you have got this team working together it's not just a host but it's 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 so many people sitting down and creating a path that that is workable it's it's a really unique teamwork between the psychologist and the organizer um, and and you probably will get a sense if you watch the show regularly that the different psychologists and the different organizers have sort of different rhythms that they establish with each other, kind of passing things back and forth uh, amongst each other. But it's really great to work with these these organizers because we bring a unique skill set. Uh, you know, I'm more of a behavior expert, so I'm I'm there to help people learn how to change what they're doing. And the organizers, uh, you know, whether you're talking about Dorothy or Corey or, or Brandon or any of these folks, um, you know, they are experts in knowing how to organize stuff and where to put things and how to do big, large scale cleanings. Yeah. So having those two people on your team is a real plus. This past week, I talked with author Ryan Matthew Cohen, who collects oddities. And in that conversation, he says, we collect so many oddities that I think we are hoarders. And I went, oh, my God, do they think they're collecting oddities? Mm -hmm. Some people think they're collecting. But when you really step back and look at it, you'll see it's apples and oranges. Oh. I mean, if you have a collection and I don't, you know, maybe you collect stamps or you collect vinyl records, or you collect those little spoons or whatever it is that you're into you tend to follow a pretty predictable pattern of behavior. You put it in a special place, you take care of it, you probably like to look at it or, or engage with it sometimes. When people come over to your house, you're usually happy to show it to them. You may even go online and read about the thing that you're enthusiastic about or, or trade, trade uh, messages with people who share that enthusiasm. And none of that describes hoarding. With hoarding, this stuff feels embarrassing. It feels shameful. It brings up a feeling of pain just to look at it. So I, I, I'm i coping with that pain by just not paying attention to it. I'm going to pretend it's not there and just throw more stuff on top of the pile. Do you think one of the first signs of someone who is hoarding is they no longer invite you into their home? I think that's probably one of the later signs of hoarding. Really? Uh, I, 
Yeah, because that suggests that the person has woken up to the problem and it's gotten to the point where they're finding it embarrassing. The earlier signs of, of hoarding, and by the way, as far as we can tell, this tends to start young, like childhood, adolescence in there. The first sign really is a tendency to acquire a lot of stuff that you don't need and a tendency to hang on to things for no really good reason, just this sense of attachment that you just can't let it go. Being a mobile entertainer, I've got several thousand CDs. Are you, are, are you thinking that maybe I should get rid of these since CDs are no longer in? Well, the question, they, I, I, they are no longer in, and, and uh, I have a CD collection myself. But I'm, I, <laughs> I guess my question to you, Arrow, would be, do you like them? Do they make you happy? No, the music does, but but it's it's in this huge, gigantic, covered case. I've not been in there for over 10 years. Yeah. I think if you're finding that it's not making you happy, and if you're finding that it's just taking up space that could be better used for something that would make you happy, then you might be better off letting it go. Yeah. Now, again, I don't want to depress that because – if it's not causing a problem in your life, okay, no big deal. And you know, it, it, it really, we really don't start getting concerned about it until your functioning starts to break down and you're really not able to live the way that you want to live in your own home. Yeah. See, I, 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 I think I have the, the hoarding tendency in, in, in the way that, so this past week when we had the hurricane here in the South, my neighbor had an extra generator. What did I do? I bought it from him. Why did I need two of them? Because what happens if the next one doesn't work? And I just feel like that I've, is that the way people do it? It's like, I got to get it because what happens if, 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 if. And, 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 and just to put you at ease, Errol, we're, we're all like that a little bit. It's okay. Um, <laughs> but just imagine turning the volume on that way, way up. And if, if that became the dominant theme of your life, that's when you're at risk of developing hoarding disorder. Yeah. What I love about the show is that it feels like that for you, it's a first step of a brand new beginning on each episode. In other words, you go in nice and fresh and you go, here's the story, here's the layout. Let's all learn from this. Yeah. Yeah. I really enjoy, I mean, I, I think you can watch this show from a lot of different angles, and certainly people could watch it from a, a, an angle that, that isn't very helpful. But I think in the best of circumstances, people are looking at this educationally, and they are interested in learning about this very significant mental health problem. And I hope that we're able to help them with that. Well, with your with your episodes of Where Are They Now? I mean, I, I can't imagine what that's going to do to you mentally as well as spiritually, because when you step back into that world and let's say it's their world has gone rewind. I mean, I, but it's like, God, I was there to teach them what what where, uh-huh. where was the breakdown? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's not going to feel good. No. Uh, I definitely get that, uh, you know, because I, I, I really when I, I go into every shoot and I am rooting for the person. I mean, I really want them to succeed. I want them to get their life together. I want them to start feeling better. And when they don't, um, you know, that doesn't feel good to me. And and I, I know it wouldn't feel good to find out that even though I thought I had done a really great job in the long run, I hadn't really helped them very much. I mean, that's a bitter pill to swallow. But, you know, I, I just think in the spirit of transparency, we've got to know. That's a big word, transparency, because we like to hide behind it, but yet at the same time, we don't live it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Wow. So does hoarding come with several different definitions? Because I can't imagine what you're seeing right there with your boots on the ground. Well, the definition of hoarding, the, 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 the central principle of hoarding disorder is an inability to let things go. And so what we find is that people get very attached to possessions, even possessions that you and I might consider to be junk. Um, they get very attached to them. They feel like it's very important. They feel like they, they just can't let it go. And so they, they put it on a pile, and then the pile builds up to the point where it starts to cause the functioning in the home to break down so that you know, you have a kitchen that you can't cook in and so on. And, and eventually your home has just started to become converted to a storage space. So when you say the, you know, you can't let things go right away, my mind is going, does it start mentally where we can't let things go mentally? So therefore we try to hide it by putting things in our home. You got it. I mean, I'll give you an example. We did, we here in, in Connecticut, we did some brain scan research in which we took people with and without hoarding disorder and we put them in a brain scanner and we asked them to make decisions about whether to throw things away or to keep things. 
And what you found is that these brains looked wildly different. The brain of somebody with hoarding disorder having to make that decision does not look like the brain of the average person who's making the same kind of decision. Something is very clearly going wrong. Mm. Where can people go to find out more about what you're doing, Dr. Dave? Well, you can find me at drtolan.com. That's as simple as that. There's no hoarding there, man. That You can't get yeah. any more simple. Oh, my God. <laughs> Please come back to this show anytime in the future. The door is always going to be open for you. Thank you, Earl. Thanks for having me. Well, you be brilliant today, okay? I'll try it. Hey, coming up next, it's going to get a little scary when it comes to the world of politics. We're with Craig Unger. Recording in progress. Hello, hello, hello. Hello. Hey. Uh, <laughs> You've got 20 minutes. If you want to go a little longer, you can, but I think you have another station with another tour soon, so. Oh, I do, I do, you're absolutely that. All right, well, you have 20, go Dude, for it. I am so excited to share a conversation with you because Den of Lies has opened up my eyes in a way that it's like, I thought I knew. I thought being in the media, I knew, but I did not know, and, and I just can't get enough information. I mean, I just keep going back in there, dude. Well, thank you. I'm I'm glad to wake up a few people. I think it's going to. I think it's going to create conversations in ways that that, you know, it's it's like I, I, you know, it's one of those. It still takes the air from my lungs. And the reason why is because when it comes to Ronald Reagan and what was going on in Iran, I the the collusion. I mean, why wasn't this on the front page? Well, uh, it it was very, very briefly, and then it was really suppressed. And I I worked for more than 33 years on and off trying to get to the bottom of this. I did some reporting back in 1990 story in Esquire magazine that got a lot of attention. But then suddenly things clamped down, and the word it was as if the word came down that this didn't happen. Everything that was reported became unreported. Uh, I was attacked for talking to arms dealers who were supposedly of no credibility um, and basically made out to conspiracy nut, uh, the tinfoil hat variety. But you know what? These things happened. I have the receipts. I actually have invoices showing that uh, the Republicans sent weapons to Iran. And at the time, it was very, very hard to believe Uh, because uh, in Iran, people were chanting death to America and calling Mm -hmm. us a great Satan. So is this associated with the Iran-Contra affair? Because, I mean, I I, I really studied that deeply, and I I kept all, I still have all my Associated Press sound bites, but but, but is it connected? Absolutely. In (gasps) fact, this is the origin of Iran-Contra. If you study the Iran-Contra in the conventional press, you think it started around 1984. Yeah. In fact, it started with this in 1980, because you had Reagan operatives who were sending weapons illegally uh, to Iran, which, which at the time held 52 American hostages. Yes. So, so they were our enemy, they were our adversary. But the Reagan forces were secretly arming them. Mm, mm. Have you ever gotten so close to the story that somebody slapped your hand saying, ah, 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 back it down, you're, you're getting way too close to this? Well, this was the one. I, I was sued by Bud McFarland, who was Reagan's national security advisor. I won, by the way. But it became virtually impossible to pr- pursue the story at various times. And I went back to it over and over again over the years. In 2014, I finally got to Iran, their procurement officers. I got to uh, France where I interviewed the former president of Iran. So I believe if this happened, there had to be an Iranian side of the story. And there was, and it did happen. Uh, And, uh, you know, I believe I have the receipts and they're printed. You can't just walk up to somebody's door and knock on it and say, hey, do you want to talk? I know I know your past, but I mean, how did, how did you even gain access to, to this information? I started talking to a lot of uh, arms dealers, among others, oh, and uh, there was a, a rogue Israeli agent named Ari ben Menashe who I talked, and a lot of people who, to be honest, were very dubious characters. Uh, but the truth is, if you want to write about arms dealing, and this is about arms dealing in a way, uh, you have to talk, the people who know most about it are arms dealers, and they're not always uh, the most uh, 
respectable people, but you hear them out and you try to corroborate and refute what they're saying. And that's what I did. Uh, and it took a long time, but I, I think I finally nailed it. How can something so illegal be looked upon as being legal? I mean, because it just seems like it's, it's just been swept underneath the carpet. Right, it was. And if you looked at the Iran-Contra hearings, I'm glad you brought that up. But Oliver North was considered uh, the key guy behind it, to, as most of Americans saw it. And to some people, he became a hero, really, a matinee idol, or at least a media star in a, in a way. And I don't think the Republicans, uh, I, I don't think it was ever explained to Americans what was really going on, that their, uh, you know, the, the, the back history, uh, you know, Americans have a real problem acknowledging our dark history. Yeah. And uh, the, the press to me failed miserably uh, in, in doing this and covering it. Uh, both when it happened in 1980 and when it started being investigated in the early 90s. I got to tell you something, Craig. I, I have so much compassion for Jimmy Carter because after reading this book, I want I want a second term with him. Because it, it, because look at what he has done for the world not being the president of the United States. Precisely. You know, we just he just celebrated his 100th yeah. birthday. And uh, he went out of office and some people were laughing at him as a weak president uh, who allowed us to be humiliated by Iran. In fact, what we now know happened is he was sabotaged by the Republican Party, uh, which put together uh, a treasonous covert operation with the Islamic fundamentalists of Iran, sending them weapons when it was completely illegal. Uh, this appears to be a vo violation of the, uh, the Logan Act, uh, and uh, I believe it was an act of treason. Am I wrong to say that, that, that Jimmy Carter did not come out just pointing fingers like it seems like everybody's doing these days? Oh, it's they did it, they did it, they did it. But I never saw anything like that from Jimmy Carter. No, and a couple of times he 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 did strongly suggest that Congress investigate it, and there was a congressional investigation. But this was a case, to me, of the the Democrats, uh, you know, bringing a knife to a gunfight. They yeah. just weren't playing tough. Uh, they didn't want to believe it, uh, and uh, there were enormous number of secret documents I found that were that were part of. Uh, the congressional investigation, but but the Democrats really didn't bother with. Uh, they stashed them away in the bowels of a storage room in Congress. Uh, a wonderful reporter who was a colleague of mine, he since died, a man named Robert Perry, uh, uncovered some of these documents. And uh, after he died, I eventually uh, got, got them. And what I, I saw within them were the receipts, so to speak, that they included invoices showing that these uh, arms transactions actually took place. Um, I was also able to get in touch with um, uh, members of Bill, Bill Casey had a secret team, an intelligence network, and I was able to get in touch with one of his political operatives and ask him, uh, did the October surprise take place? And he said, absolutely, 100 million percent. And he told me and started giving me the details of how he set up these secret meetings in Madrid with uh, members, uh, with some Iranian officials and uh, operatives working for the Republican Party. How did you get your hands on these documents? Because it seems like lately the president and former president both were busted for having documents. And, and yet you've, you get documents. Right. Well, some of them I did get from uh, uh, from the arms dealers themselves. Uh, I mentioned this Arad Ben-Menashe. He was considered a very dubious character. He was sort of a rogue Israeli agent slash arms dealer. But he did give me documents showing that he was dealing arms to Iran. Wow. Um, I, I did get some that I, I mentioned were stashed away in the bowels of con Congress that my, my colleague Bob Perry had uh, had rescued from being thrown away. Uh, so the documents were there, but they were buried. And uh, I, I think it's uh, long past time that they saw the light of day and that Americans really know about the, these, the, these dark parts of our history that a lot of people, you know, sort of don't really want to hear the, yeah. the dirty, dirty truth. 
but we have to know it if we're to avoid repeating it. And, uh, you know, I, I see it very much as a prequel to what we're going through today. Uh -huh. In the old days, it was secretive uh, and, and, and hidden. Donald Trump often boasts uh, to Russia, if you have those documents, uh, if you have those emails, put them out. Uh, so in some ways, his alliance with with Putin is very much out there in the open. This was secret, and that's the big difference uh, between what happened uh, 40 years ago and today. Yeah, right from the very beginning of this book, you can't help but sit there and, and start comparing the notes from today saying, oh, my God, it's happening again. Oh, what am I going to learn? But what can I be? To, uh, you know, Because we all have to have a voice and we have to activate ourselves. But you're absolutely right. There is a connection still going on here, and, I, and it makes me just want to question everything. Absolutely. I mean, you know, you think of us as a democracy, but but we we we've been burying the truth for years. I mean, this was a country that was born with slavery. Uh, when Thomas Jefferson said all men are created equal, he didn't include African Americans. He didn't include women. Yeah. He didn't include six children he'd had with his former slave. Um, and those are the parts that we don't like to talk about. What's hidden. Uh, and, and I think in uh, this is something that took place early in my lifetime, early in my, my days as a reporter, and I've always wanted to uncover the truth. Uh, it, it's sort of been my uh, white whale, as it, as it were, something uh, that people wanted hidden, a truth that no one wants to, to, to address. But I believe it has to come out if we're truly to function as a democracy and have fair elections. You know, having so much dedication and loyalty to to you know bringing out the truth. How did you get by those those editors and bosses who always say you're on our platform? This is the way we need to present it. Come on, you you've got to go our way. Use your fancy words and make it happen. Well, I didn't always. I did. You know, it, it's interesting. I uh, when I went to Esquire magazine, they did we did we did the story and they were terrific and it was all published. Wow. But when I went to Newsweek. Bam, mm -hmm. things, uh, it, it was all shut down. Uh, and at the time, uh, you know, Henry Kissinger was another contributor to Newsweek. So I, I have to think, well, I, I don't know everything that went on with the, with the top editors, but I have to think uh, Kissinger played a role in this. And who are they going to believe? Henry Kissinger, a, a major uh, figure on the world stage, or me, a little old reporter who uh, not everyone has heard about. Your book is filled with so many great quotes and thoughts, and one of them that really got inside my heart. If we don't like it, we must come to terms with it. It's like, whoa, take two steps back. Let's let's figure this out again. Right. I mean, uh, when, when you, it's such an ugly, ugly uh, uh, thing that the Republicans did. It's really hard to believe in a, in a certain way. And I was quite taken aback by it. Uh, I, I didn't really believe it initially. Uh, the, um, there was a wonderful op-ed piece in the New York Times back in April of 1991. And it was the first clue to what really happened. Uh, uh, a man named Gary Sick, who was uh, on the National Security Council. Uh, uh, he was a RAND specialist for Jimmy Carter, and he wrote about it, and it was sort of breathtaking to me. And I, I figured if he was right, there had to be a lot more behind it that you, you know, he, he wrote like a, uh, uh, an op-ed piece for the New York Times, but there had to be a great uh, narrative there. It's a great spy story. Um, there, there were mysterious deaths. Uh, one of the arms dealers died very mysteriously. Uh, his name was Cyrus Hashemi. A, a reporter who was on it named Danny Casalero uh, ended up uh, in in his in a bathtub with his wrists slit, yeah. and a lot of people thought he was murdered. So this was a story with a lot of twists and turns. Uh, uh, I worked uh, on and off for more than 30 years to try to get it right. Uh, I think it's a real spy thriller. Um, <laughs> but you have, again, resistance again and again and again from the powers that be who don't want it out. Um, you know, one, one of the great problems with the American press is what I call access journalism. And there are times when I, I think Donald, treat, Donald Trump is treated too seriously. People don't 
question his lies enough. And if that's the case, it's generally because reporters want access to him. If you want access to a powerful figure in American politics, you don't go around insulting him or he's never going to talk to you yep. again. Yep. It's yep. simple as that. And I, I think that was a big uh, uh, factor in covering up the October surprise. Wow, wow. You, you say that it's, it's a thriller. I wish you could see my notes because I put the title itself and the story feels like the entire plot of a Hollywood movie. And it does. It feels like, because I, I, I went into it going, is this real? It, it feels like a movie. It's, it doesn't feel like it's real. Uh, you know, I, I felt that way a lot. And I, I had to put it aside to get on with my career because at a certain point I just couldn't make a living pursuing it. But at the same time, I never wanted to let go. So uh, whenever I had free time, uh, I, I took a trip to Paris to interview the, the former president of Iran, uh, President uh, Bani Sadr. Oh, I wow. finally got to Iran in 2014. I realize that's 10 years ago now. Uh, but uh, I was able to interview some of the Iranians and get more information on it. Um, so it, it's it's tough to get it, and our, our news cycles spin so fast that you wonder if the American public is going to pay attention. Mm -hmm. And I sure hope they do, because uh, if you don't remember the past, we're going to repeat it. And if that happens uh, this November, I think we're in big trouble. That's why this book is so, so important. And for selfish reasons, I'm going to tell you why. Because when, when this was taking place beginning in the 1980s, in the early part of 1980, I was a, a punk 17-year-old kid in high school that wanted that thing over in Iran because I did not want to be pulled into a war that I didn't create. And so, and I've held on to this all of these years. I get this book now and I'm going, holy crap, I, I had no idea. That's why my generation is we get into the later years, we need to know what, what happened. Absolutely. And, you know, you think, well, we have a free press. Shouldn't we be covering this all? And it, it, it's very depressing to me what's happened to uh, um, the media in this country. And I think yeah. since the advent of social media, everyone is uh, in their own little silo. Uh, when I grew up, it was a world in which Walter Cronkite gave the news and he spoke to America. He spoke to people on both Democrats and Republicans uh, and uh, he was honest and, and we learned more or less the truth. Uh, we, I, I remember in 1968, he turned against the war in Vietnam. And it was a seminal moment that really started to change our policy because we started to learn the truth. But I think that happens less and less with the advent of social media and the people are able to ignore things or, or just uh, uh, stay safely in their own little silo without bothering to uh, do a deep dive to get to the, the, the real facts of the matter uh, behind the scene. Where I always thought that the media started going wrong or awry was, was when the teletype machine was no longer in newsrooms or it was no longer at radio stations. And we relied on newspapers to get our stories. Well, we know how biased they can be, but that's to me, that, that was the turning point of where the media was going to grow. Right. Well, we're in a very odd place now where there's no uh, everything is very, very fragmented. Uh, and, and I think people uh, don't listen to the news. I, right. I, I don't. There is a one big voice that people listen to in the way that there were when you had you had three big networks, but they were basically speaking to all of the American people at the time. Now it's fragmented into a million uh, uh a little mil uh, a million little voices. You know what's really interesting about what you've done here, Craig, is the fact that you've taken all of this history, all of these documents that you've got, and you've now set it free inside this book. That means that even if they come in there and they take your information, it's already out here. It's we're we're all going to know it. Well, I hope so. I mean, at the same time, it's. Uh, you know, it's hard having a voice loud enough that it makes an impact on the American people as a whole. Uh, and that, that all, doesn't always happen. Uh, that is, you can have a book out there and it gets buried. But I, I would I think this is an important part of our Amer American history uh, that we have to understand. And it's especially important as we approach another uh, presidential election um, that that people have to know the truth. Uh, they have to know that the Republicans have 
uh, sabotaged uh, presidential elections or they've intervened with it again and again and again. And I go into this in my book uh, a lot, but they did it in uh, 1968 uh, and 1972, you had Watergate. Uh, I write, this book is about what really happened in 1980. Um, in 2000, you had the Brooks Brothers riots again. Mm -hmm. So, so had uh, problems with our elections repeatedly. And, uh, um, you know, it, it, as we approach this election, it's hard to believe we will go through this entire month of October with no malfeasance in the election. And we have to be alert, alert for that. And that's one reason we have to understand the past. Oh, we absolutely do. And I, I totally believe in that. So now, did you have to go through an editing process with the government in order to release this? Because I know many men and women who serve our nation, they, when they write books, they've got to send it through the government. Uh, no, I didn't. Well, wow. I'm not with the government anymore. I guess if I'd been with the CIA, I probably would have. Um, but I, I was able to get uh, classified documents that had been stashed away in the bowels of Congress uh, as part of the congressional investigation. Um, I mean, there is material in this that was uh, was classified, uh, but I didn't get it as uh, being part of the CIA. How do we get this story to get back into the history of what is going on in the modern world? In, the, in meaning that we know it happened back in 1980, but yet your truths now are 2024. It it has to be told and it has to be told this way growing forward. Yes, it does, and and, and I mean I, I I think we you know when we we dealt with the 2016 election and the uh, the attempts in 2020 to undermine the election. Uh, I think uh, the January 6th commission did a fair, pretty good job of recreating what happened uh, with the events leading up to January 6th. So there's one time in which we got a pretty good idea of what really happened in uh, almost in real time. Mm -hmm. We need more of that. We need real accountability. Uh, we need over government oversight. And that has been muted again and again and again by the Republicans, but we need it more than ever. This book needs to be in the front of the store. I mean, is that, do you guys, I don't know the, the marketing side of how you get a book like this up there in the front of the store, but I mean, are they going to do that? Because it doesn't need to be sitting on the shelf where we just see the binder. Why? Well, I certainly hope so. I mean, that's one of the things with this country. It, it, uh, books can be a tough sale, you know, that not everyone goes to the bookstores all the time. Uh, um, and and uh, the internet has taken over our lives, and I, I you know I've certainly seen that happen in my uh, lifetime, both as a, a maker of someone who writes the news and someone who con consumes it. So, um, I, I but I think it's it's important that people uh, try to explore in depth what really happened. Yeah. Uh, everything is reduced to sound bites these days. Um, on Twitter or X as it's now called, you know, you get short little snippets here and there. Uh, this requires a little more than there than that. It's it's a it's a to me it's a spy thriller. It's it's <laughs> it's, a, it's a you know it's it, it, with a, with an, with a, a a very sophisticated and complicated narrative. But you you see a secret spy ring put together by Bill Casey, he's the yes. Republican campaign yes. manager. And while he's running a presidential campaign with one hand, he's got a covert operation going on with the other, and he's got to get away with it. Imagine if you can, running a presidential campaign, a winning one at that, with one hand, and then secretly trying to get millions and millions of dollars of weapons to a hostile foreign power when you're a private citizen, you're not even in the government. And that's what the Republicans did. It's extraordinary. I can't thank you enough for this book. I just really can't. And you got to come back to the show anytime in the future. The door is always going to be open for you. Well, thank you. I'd very much like to come back. Excellent. Will you be brilliant today? Okay, sir? Thank you. I appreciate your time. Do not move. A modern day Indiana Jones is next. Mr. Josh Gates. Lonnie, I'll say hello to Arrow first. Hi, Arrow. It's Irene. Before we get started with Josh, how are you doing this morning? Doing very well. How about you? 
Excellent. I've got Josh with me, but I wanted to check. Do you have an air date for this? Yeah, it'll be up tomorrow. Tomorrow. Wonderful. And Arrow, you're good to take your full window. The line is open and you can say hi to Josh. Good morning, Josh. How are you doing today? I'm really well, Arrow. How are you doing? Absolutely fantastic. Looking forward to sharing a conversation with you because you're a modern day explorer. If this were a ship and that ocean was undiscovered, you would be on that boat. Well, that's the that's the thrill of, of making Expedition Unknown, getting to go around the world and explore all sorts of incredible mysteries and working alongside other explorers. It's uh, it's what makes the job real fun. What I love about what you do on Expedition Unknown is the fact that you're not just hitting Google like like so many people do. And they think, you know, oh, I know everything because I, I read about it. No, you're physically getting out there and getting your hands dirty. Yeah, you know, I have to say, I think one of the things that makes the show so exciting to to work on, but I think also for, for viewers to watch, is that we all do kind of yearn for an adventure, to get away from our keyboards, to get away from our screens, to go out into the unknown. We all love a mystery, right? So to be able to go to these places firsthand, to get down in the dirt literally with these archaeologists and be there for the moment of discovery in many cases, that is such a thrill, and it's something you just can't replicate you know, by uh, doing a Google search. It, that that feeling, that excitement of being in the moment. Would you say that archaeologists are also visionaries? Because when they find something, they have to envision what it could be and where it could be. Yeah, I think they are. I think they're also really a determined group of people. You know, archaeology is tough. It's, it's, um, it's not only out in the hot sun digging in the dirt, but it, it's a very careful, methodical science, you know? It's one of the only sciences where the very act of doing what you're doing kind of destroys the evidence, right? Digging down into these layers risks at all times destroying what's down there. So archaeologists have this really kind of high wire act of having to go down to discover the past, but conserve it, preserve it, interpret it right? Figure out what is the story that maybe just one little bone or one small shirt of pottery yeah. can tell us. And so I think it does require a lot of vision and a lot of determination. See, I'm very inspired by stuff like this because I'm also a hider. It was uh, September 11th, 2002 on the one year anniversary of September 11th that I did a painting on a wall at one Julian Price place and they put a wall over that painting. It's been there all of these years and nobody has found it yet. And, and how does that feel? I love it. I love it. But, I, but, but I, yeah. I, I, I have that fear, though, that I'm not going to be here when they find it. Well, maybe not. But that's, you know, one of the things that's so interesting about going to an archaeological dig is that so many of the things you find there, the people who left them behind, they didn't know that they were leaving behind a time capsule oh. for the future. You know, I mean, so many of the things you find, like, are just some little daily use things, somebody's cooking pot, somebody's, you know, um, a container or, or vessel. And they don't know at the time that they're leaving behind a huge fingerprint, a huge clue for the future. So even if you're not around when that painting gets found, um, won't it be amazing when somebody does find it and uh, you'll be a voice speaking out from the past in a way that lots of other people won't be able to. What does it smell like? That's the only thing that I'm, I'm not getting from the TV show. I mean, because, I mean, you've got to be getting into areas where you're going, oh, my God. Yeah, you know, it depends. It can be a dirty business. Yeah. You know, you talk about dirty jobs, it can be dirty jobs. I mean, a lot of it is out in the baking sun, down in the dirt. In our season premiere, we're going to be going into some tombs. Those tombs <sighs> can be wet. They can be moldy. They're filled with human remains. So you can imagine... Uh, it does get a little funky sometimes. What is the show prep like to do something like that? When you go back get down into those tombs, I mean, because, I mean, to me, you would have to be fully pr protected as well as prepared. Yeah, you know, that that's part of what you don't always see on the show is that some of these stories have a really long lead up. I mean, we've done stories where we have literally worked for years uh, to make an episode. We wanted to do a show a number of years ago on the Dead Sea Scrolls. And, you know, you can't just go make a show on something like that without the cooperation and participation of archaeologists that are doing the work. And so it took a few years to find the right moment when an excavation was happening that we could be a part of. Our season premiere for the new season all takes place at Petra. So folks know Petra because yeah. it was the home of the Holy Grail and Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. It's this incredibly famous site in Jordan. And that's not a place you can just waltz into and say, hey, we're gonna make a big special here and dig around and look for tombs. So it takes a lot of 
of uh, good fortune and uh, a lot of cooperation with the archaeologists and the experts that are working in these countries to get ready to be able to go there and to have these adventures. Yeah, I was going to ask you about how you got permission to be there because you can't just call them up and say, hey, I'm going to be bringing my equipment over there. I mean, I mean, you've got to answer those questions, who, what, where, why, when, and how, and dot that I. That's right. That's right. And, and in the case of our of our premiere at Petra, you know, that building at Petra that everybody knows from Indiana Jones, it's called the Treasury Building. It is one of the most famous archaeological historic sites in the world. Right. That's the postcard shot. Everybody knows that building. But what's incredible is how much we don't know about what it was really for. We don't really know its function. It's called the treasury because there used to be a rumor that it was filled with riches, but there's no riches in there. Uh, It might be a tomb. Some people have suggested it's a palace or that it had some big stately function. Nobody really knows. And so this um, this excavation, this this season premiere is about working alongside archaeologists that are digging beneath that building for the first time to see what's underneath it. And that is a huge privilege to have that kind of access to dig underneath a world wonder. What do you expect to be under? I mean, can, I mean, can you imagine it? I mean, I mean, I, I mean, to, I mean, that's like writing the story before it happens. What what could be there? Well, what is so incredible about Petra is that the city is like a layer cake. And when you go there, there are all these rock carved tombs in the walls of this canyon. And as you walk on the sand today and you look down, you see the tops of doorways because the entire canyon has been choked with sand over the centuries. So there's whole sections of this really famous city that nobody's ever seen. By some estimates, only 10 or 15% of Petra has been excavated. So beneath the treasury, we know the treasury was a super important building and we know this city is a layer cake. So we know that underneath it, there should be more. And so a big part of what the premiere is about is going down and discovering that, in fact, there is more and there is something beneath the treasury, which is really exciting. When you locate truth, how do you plant it in modern day history so that it's taught forward and not always looking back at a past that at one point in time we didn't know about? Well, that's a that's a really interesting question. You know, I mean, I think one of the things that that I get excited about in making uh, the show is helping people understand, especially younger viewers, that history is alive. It's not just this thing in the past. You know, I've had so many people come up to me over the years and say, hey, is there really anything left to find in the world? Are there real, (laughs) really discoveries to be made still? Because I do think we live in this age where so much information is at our fingertips. We have these magical phones in our pocket. We feel like we could type anything into Google Maps and it'll take us there. And people are surprised sometimes to learn how much we still don't know about our past. And so I think we try to make that history feel very in the moment, very alive, and to help people understand that this isn't just the ancient past. These stories about these great civilizations, they really do speak to us about our own lives and our own future, you know? I mean, I've spent a lot of time digging around in places like ancient Egypt and ancient Rome. I mean, these are civilizations that really had their act together for a very long time, and now they're gone. So what does that mean? And what does that tell us? And what lessons can we learn from those places to take us into the future, right? And that's what's so exciting about it is that this isn't just some dusty thing from from a textbook. It's very much in the now and it does affect us in the future. Are you keeping journals on this? Because your imagination will one day be gone like one of these relics as well. (laughs) <laughs> it's you know what I when, whenever people say to me what's what's your advice for what to pack on a trip and what to bring and my best <laughs> advice is that pack a journal and every day try to write something down on it I'm guilty of not always taking my own advice I take some trips where I do it and some trips where I don't but I have to tell you looking back at even if it's not you look it doesn't need to be uh you know poetry but even just a small entry of hey here's what I did today here's how it felt Here's what I saw. Here's what it emotionally felt like. That is so much more impactful, even for yourself in the future, than any photograph. You know, um, there's something about reading your own thoughts on something that really transports you back to a place. So it's a great uh, piece of advice is to always keep a journal of some kind wherever you go. See, to be a fly on the wall when somebody gets to read your your journals after your transition, because then then they have their interpretation of what you put on that page. Yeah, I mean, look, that that's a big part of one of the things that you learn at these archaeology sites is that this continuity of information is a big deal. And in the ancient world, 
you know, look, nobody thinks they're going away, right? No civilization thinks it's going to end. Everybody thinks they're out. We live in a very different age now where information is kind of encoded all around us. But in the past, you know, you just look at like the Nabataeans, the, 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 the people who built Petra, mm -hmm. they had a, a, a massive, beautiful theater at the site, an 8,000 seat amphitheater. But we don't have any any ancient plays from Petra. We don't have any of their writing. There's almost no writing that survives from this vibrant civilization. Wow. It's just gone. And so uh, it is true that that writing things down, communicating things forward, um, that's what it's all about in terms of, of us as enduring and thriving and getting better. We have to sort of pay that knowledge forward. And that's a big part of what I'm unpacking the little puzzle pieces of interest. Oh, I love where your heart is. Josh, you got to come back to this show anytime in the future. The door is always going to be open for you. Hey, man, I really appreciate it. Uh, it's really a pleasure talking to you. Well, you'll be brilliant today, okay? Hey, you too, man. Thank you so much, Errol.